Stuff good? One minute. So, good morning, people. Hope you all had a great time last night. Um, announcements, uh, please tell us what you think of ShmooCon. Uh, what do you like? What can we do better? Um, basically, capture anyone in a blue shirt and tell them. Uh, or uh, send mail to feedback at shmoocon.org. Um, I don't have puzzle questions for you this morning. Um, <laughs> this way! No! Oh! 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 Kyle and Madison are going to talk to us about uh, embedded device vulnerability analysis with Trummel. So hi everyone, uh, again, our talk is called Embedded Device Vulnerability Analysis, Case Study Using Trommel. Sorry for the wordiness. Also, please bear with me, I am sick, so if I cough, sorry. Sorry for those in the front row. <laughs> we have to have this up here as a disclaimer. Huh? Yes, I can. Uh, so we work at the CERT Coordination Center. Again, my name is Madison Oliver. I'm in my second year of a master's program at Carnegie Mellon, and I've been an intern on the vulnerability analysis team for a little over a year. Uh, how are you doing? I'm Kyle. Oh, those work? All right, well, I'll, just, I'll just jump over here for a second. I'm Kyle. Uh, I've been at uh, CERT now for about three years. I'm on the attack modeling team on the vulnerability analysis team. And then uh, part-time, I also teach grad school at Carnegie Mellon, too. So this is the agenda that our presentation will be following. Uh, we'll give you guys a brief introduction, go through the motivation behind our work, the methodology, uh, our results from applying the methodology, some future work we'd like to do, and a brief conclusion. So as I'm sure you guys are all super hyper aware, embedded devices are becoming much more ubiquitous a lot easier to find, and are pretty much everywhere. Uh, so as these devices are increasing in popularity, the research regarding these vulnerabilities needs to also be increasing. Um, there's not like a simple step-by-step -step process, a clear methodology when vulnerability testing embedded devices. So we're proposing a macro level one to create complete and thorough research when vulnerability testing embedded devices. Again, motivation is to do exactly what I just said. Uh, and we'd like to ensure that every component of the embedded device is at least minimally tested throughout the entire research process. So someone that's researching vulnerabilities in an embedded device isn't solely focusing on the hardware or isn't solely focusing on the web application or the way that they're communicating. So our methodology consists of these following parts, embedded device list curation, information gathering, firmware analysis, web application analysis, mobile application analysis, hardware analysis, and vulnerability analysis. So we'll start with embedded device list curation. This only needs to be completed if the researcher doesn't have a specific device in mind to test. So we had to do this for our process because we wanted to apply this to something, so we had to come up with a device to then test our methodology. Usually for going into this, though, you already have a device in mind that you will be testing, so you don't particularly have to do this step if you have a device. So some of the key considerations that we looked for when we were choosing a device was access to the physical device. It's kind of hard to test the hardware if you don't have the hardware, uh, and access to the firmware in any capacity. Um, so we also considered the number of firmware versions, the availability of the firmware, and whether or not it's still being maintained, and if there were multiple versions for us to test. So if it had all of that, it was a better device for us to apply our methodology to. So information gathering is just background research about the device, collecting anything we can about past or present vulnerabilities in that device, in similar devices from the same manufacturer, similar devices across manufacturers. Uh, just we identified any vulnerability, past or present, associated with that vendor, and that vendor similar devices, um, and then identified and marked any exploits to later test on the device in question. We also use things like exploit DB and virus total. 
Next, we did some firmware analysis. Take one. So uh, in the firmware analysis process, right, we just really gathered the firmware itself, used binwalk to sort of, uh, ideally explode the firmware, uh, expose the underlying file system itself. And then, so this is sort of how the product all started out of. I was doing a lot of this firmware analysis research. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I didn't want to run like 300 grep statements all the time. There's a couple other tools out there that kind of did some high level things, but I wanted more uh, granular process. So I uh, developed this tool called Trommel. It's out there on GitHub. We'll show you the link at the end. But basically what I was just trying to do is highlight a bunch of indicators, such as like SSH keys or passwords or things like that, keywords that you can look for in exploited embedded system file systems. And then you can key on those and see are, are they hard coding passwords, which yes, they probably are. Uh, are there any other vulnerabilities itself? I also, there's a tool out there called vFeed. Um, we can't endorse any tools, but it worked great for what we were doing. It's a database uh, that created um, the individual created, and it allows you to then query based on CVEs, right? So I would search for, like, uh, in this case, you'll see later on, I'll search for a specific binary, I'll query this database against that, and then I'll return any kind of CVEs associated with it. Maybe it might have Metasploit modules associated with it, maybe have exploit DB in there as well. Um, and then it allows sort of a more fluid process of, like, okay, now we sort of have an idea that this, you know, these binaries might be vulnerable and go forth from there. So next we'll talk about the web application analysis. Uh, most embedded devices contain some sort of web interface, easier way for you to do administrative management, see things when you're not physically around the device, uh, and there's tons of open source tools for testing. There are just so many, uh, and most generally just test web app vulnerabilities. So we use OWASP's app and Nikto for our testing. Uh, they're freely available, easy to use, did everything that we wanted them to do. Uh, OWASP app is a proxy used to intercept website requests and uses this to actively and passively scan for vulnerabilities. And Nikto searches for potentially malicious files, checks versions, and looks for specific issues relating to the versions used. So you, when you're doing this yourself, obviously you can use a number of different tools. It's just important that ideally you use more than one. That way you can cross-reference findings and hopefully multiple tools will have the same findings. So in most cases, with any embedded device, you hope there's some kind of mobile application, right, that you can look at, right? Uh, we uh, happen to look at just the uh, Android apps themselves that we're able to easily get from, you know, Google Play Store. And uh, from there, we just use AP Key Tool, uh, AK, AP, yeah, K Tool, to then, like, kind of explode it, right? Uh, show the underlying source code and any other text files associated with it. Then I would just run Trommel against that tool to hope to find similar findings based on the indicators I was looking for. You know, is, 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 it, is the APK itself like hard coding passwords, including passwords, is there anything of interest and things like that? That's also you. <laughs> and then the next step we thought we'd take is that I think that, you know, in the process we should look at hardware, right? Uh, what I mean by that, um, you know, because everybody's going to have a different level of experiences looking at hardware. So the first process is like just kind of identifying what's on there. There's lots of information on the, the case itself. You can, you know, FCC IDs, right? Then you can query the FCC database and see what kind of documents were submitted during that time, what kind of components they might be listed in there. Um, and then open up the case itself, right? what's on the PCB itself, right? What kind of components can you pull off there? Can you compare that against what you found maybe in any kind of regulatory database, like I was saying, FCC database or IC database in Canada? Um, then attempt to try to dump the memory off that device, right? Usually on the back of any of these devices, it'll say, like, oh, it has firmware version, blah, 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 included on it already. Uh, based, and then the, uh, the most updated version on the website might be a later version, right? So kind of, kind of do kind of cross comparison of that. Can you extract the memory itself? Once you extract it, can we then uh, actually use binwalk to explode it? show an underlying file system, or is it just like a zip file itself that just contains files? And then compare the extracted components to what was on the, you know, what kind of firmware was out there. Like, what, how common are, is the, what files are in the firmware itself to what, you know, the newest version of firmware out there, what's on there, um, cross-compare that firmware itself, or the, actually the files themselves. And obviously the entire point of this is to do vulnerability analysis at the end. Uh, so we broke this down in two different steps. We reviewed the firmware update for the patches that they've uh, later applied. 
These are usually found in the release notes, and they weren't uh, extremely difficult to find. This was to see when and if vulnerabilities that we found were fixed. So if we found that there was a vulnerability in it, we could pinpoint exactly which patch it was, if it was fixed, test the device to see if it had the fix, or see if it was never fixed. And then we tested actual exploits against the device. So in our background research, we found exploits for the device in question, similar devices from the same vendor, and tested all of them against the, uh, against the device to see if there was any cross-compatibility. Um, and obviously, take caution when downloading exploits and review the code before testing it against the chosen device. <laughs> So if we found any vulnerabilities that had not yet been disclosed, obviously we went through proper disclosure. Um, it all depends on the vendor. Ideally, they'll have something on their website where you can submit vulnerabilities that you find. If that doesn't exist, you can follow the CERT Guide to Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure. Uh, we were lucky enough that the vendor that we chose had a portal on their website, though it was, could be improved a little bit. Um, we went through that process. So we applied the methodology that we created to a D-Link DCS 935 HD Wi-Fi camera. Now we'll go into why we chose that. So we compiled a list of nearly 300 different embedded devices, and we chose D-Link because their firmware was readily available. You can download the firmware of any of their embedded devices online, free, super easy to find, and they have all of the versions available. So we tested the five different firmware versions that are currently out for this camera. 1.04, 06, 08, 09, and 10. So did a significant amount of background research on this particular camera. Found 16 different vulnerabilities corresponding with CVs, vol numbers, Metasploit modules, and exploit database uh, exploits. There are not currently any vulnerabilities for that camera. So everything we found were other similar HD Wi-Fi cameras made by D-Link, but not this particular model. And some of the vulnerabilities we found in other cameras that we decided to test in this camera were like remote code execution, cross-site scripting, denial service, directory traversal, things of that nature. So uh, doing, starting with the firmware analysis, I just wanted to look at the newest available firmware there was out there. So obviously, just use Binwalk to kind of explode it. Uh, luckily, it did have an underlying file system, SquashFS, right, which is a typical uh, use of file systems in embedded devices now. It's not the only one. There's a few others out there. There's a few that exist that are no longer supported, but people still use them in their devices. I've come across this. I've come across this zipped upon zipped upon zip, you know, uh, firmware, and then it just dumps a file system under that. Sometimes it's just like one zip and it's like a bunch of you know flat text files themselves. And then once we uh, extracted that, I ran Trommel. Uh, we'll show you a little demo. We didn't mention we're going to do a little demo later. Demo in a sense, I'll show you how it works real quickly. Um, but running Trommel, I came across two files of interest, right? I call them files of interest, right? Because they kind of uh, allow you to do more exploratory research then. Like the information in there I thought was uh, more product information that should have been left in the device itself. Uh, in this case, it's just a Wi-Fi camera, but you can think of a, uh, you know, in a case if you're looking at satellite firmware or, you know, airplane, you know, Wi-Fi hotspots and things like that, the information they're leaving in there, I felt allowed us to do more information gathering and could lead down more paths of more vulnerability analysis. Additionally, I found an uh, old version of BusyBox. Now you're saying, how do I do that? Well, that's where that V feed uh, component that I integrated into the Trommel works, right? So I was able to I pull out specific binaries and I query them against the VFeed database. In this case, the version that we had is an old version at the specific time of research. So this research goes back to uh, end of October-ish, right? So at that point in time, it had a vulnerable version of um, BusyBox. And then these, and then the BusyBox itself had three CVEs associated with that uh, that version. So we tested the web app the, for this camera. The purpose of the web app uh, was to do administrative. Uh, it was just an administrative interface of the camera. Uh, and you could view the live feed uh, on your computer when you were away from the camera itself. So we, again, used OWASP, Zap, and Nikto. Zap spider the web page and perform active scans. Uh, returned four different findings. Two of these were, I felt, more of a best practice than in like an actual vulnerability. Uh, the XSS protection wasn't enabled in the browser, and the X content type options header was missing. Uh, there were two vulnerabilities that we found in there that had not 
previously been reported and at no point were patched along any of the newer firmware versions. So we've since contacted the vendor and are going through their vulnerability disclosure process. And then again, we use Nikto. It found all, it confirmed all of the findings that OWASP's app found, but it did find one unique additional vulnerability, which was that the cross domain.xml contains a full wildcard entry, which means that uh, it's a part of Adobe Flash, and the wildcard entry just allows any trusted website to view user information, so you can compromise the trusted website to then get access to the hosting website. So it was an additional finding that Nikto found that Zap didn't, but again, used two different tools and confirmed all of the findings. So, like I said, we were able to pull down D-Link's uh, mobile app they use for this specific device, and most of their web cameras from the Google Play Store. Uh, I just used APK tool to kind of explode it, like I said, decode the uh, APK itself, and I ran Trommel. At, like, at that point in time, I found nothing based on what I was looking for specifically that outlined any kind of vulnerabilities that might be in the uh, APK itself. That doesn't mean that there wasn't any that exist. Like, you know, my research wasn't probably as exhaustive as it could be. Uh, still working on that mobile application piece, but at the point in time, didn't find anything that like red flagged. You know, there's some vulnerabilities in the APK itself. So the hardware analysis piece, right? So this is that five-step process that we kind of put together. Uh, first thing I did was sort of uh, identified all the markings on the back, right? So, you know, I'm not going to read out this list to you, but like the case itself had a lot of information on it. The firmware version was, you know, most important kind of uh, any regulatory information. I was able to query databases, see what they submitted there. Can I compare that to what uh, I will compare in the next step? Um, but those are the sort of things you want to go off of. And it's, it's interesting is that they submitted different documents. Sometimes you can find different documents are submitted to each regulatory, I guess, depending on what, you know, how Canada does the regulation versus China versus the United States. So then I opened it up uh, inside, and I tried to identify as many of the components I could. Uh, some of them were easy to read, some of them were not. I uh, had to you know, try to wipe away some uh, gunk that was on there, I guess, in some case. I um, was able to identify uh, six different chips on there, uh, but I was specifically looking for like what was the actually memory chip on the device itself, and I identified it as the Micronix chip itself, and then um, from there, I was able to try to find any data sheets. Now, this is sort of interesting trying to find a data sheet sort of associated with it because eventually you want to find the pinouts and like what pins go to what, data in, data out, power and things like that. Um, not always are on the website, uh, but you can sometimes find other vendors that might have these things, so be careful when you're trying to find the data sheets and pulling down PDFs from uh, maybe less than, us, you know, websites that might be a little more sketchy than not. So then after that, I was able to find the pinouts. Uh, I was able to put it together. I don't know how big the pictures are. So I used a bus pirate to do much of it, and then flash ROM. Uh, it took me, well, for the fourth time, I finally was successful. I almost gave up after like the third time, but I said, let me try one more time. Uh, it's sort of a linear process, right? Once you find the pinouts, you just connect either an SOIC clip to it, you know, and collect that to the bus pirate. The bus pirate communicates with flash ROM easily, right? And then it hopefully reads the chip, right? Unfortunately, we all know that doesn't work as smoothly as possible. So I kind of threw away the SOIC clip and said, let me try these micro clips I have from a saline logic analyzer I have. And luckily, that did it enough. Additionally, another hurdle I found is like, do I power it from the bus pirate or do I power it from its power supply itself? So like that was a back and forth thing. And I actually say four times, I think I did about six times before I was successfully like able to dump the firmware itself, which is that other screenshot, which you probably can't see at all, but trying to show success, I took a picture because I was pretty happy that day. Um, and uh, once I was able to dump that, uh, we I kind of, we labeled it itself that since the firmware on the back of the device said this is firmware 1.04, we said, okay, well, I'll call this 1.04 firmware itself. We never updated it. We didn't connect it to internet and things like that. So from there, um, I extracted the contents of that firmware we pulled off the device and then compared it against the newest available firmware at the point in time that we had, which was the 1.10.01. Um, on the device itself had an even older version of uh, BusyBox, which I guess would be expected. Um, there's no way to know the dates and times that this firmware was actually put on the device. Uh, this firmware, uh, this BusyBox itself had uh, six CVEs associated with it. 
Um, unfortunately, no exploits or Metasploit modules at the time. But like we all know, right, just because there's no exploit doesn't mean the device isn't vulnerable of some sort, right? It just takes someone some time and some energy to uh, develop an exploit. And then the last thing is that I tried to compare, uh, like, the files on the firmware themselves, right? So I compared what was off the device to the oldest firmware we were able to pull down from this website, and what was off the device and the newest firmware off the website. So they're trying to do a, just a straight file comparison based on MD5 hashes. The idea to see sort of how much of the files are changing from firmware to firmware. And uh, luckily, based on the percentages and just doing a simple sort of, you know, comparison that they seem to be updating their firmware, there's not much uh, information that's like remains stagnant from firmware to firmware. However, shared object libraries it seem to most be most common, right? Uh, we're doing some other research, a colleague is doing some other research right now looking at library files, right? So if you find a vulnerability in a, a library file and it's used across all your devices, well then you're gonna be kind of affected there, right? Across all your devices. So uh, that's you know can be a future concern if someone signs something in a library file. So we manually reviewed the firmware updates from zero or 1.04 to 1.10. Uh, showed that we had two new vulnerabilities that had never been reported and then patched. Manually looked through all of the release notes, everything that was updated and reported, and these never showed up, insinuating that they had never been reported and therefore never patched. Uh, and then we attempted all these known exploits against the devices. Again, these were exploits for similar devices from the same vendor, not particularly for this device. So they did not return results, uh, but it's not, it does not mean that that device is not vulnerable. It could be that that ex exploit does not perfectly cross and that something minor could be adjusted uh, so it would work. Uh, and again, we are following the process outlined by the vendor. They have a disclosure page, it's fairly easy to find. They uh, have still not responded to us. So we are going through the CERT Coordination Center process at this point, and we'll ideally have those vulnerabilities disclosed to the public very soon. Uh, some future work could include applying this methodology to other devices. So our goal was to create this methodology, and as a case study, we applied it to one single device. We would obviously like to apply this to other devices, other embedded devices, other cameras, other things that are not cameras, um, and any other vendors as well. Um, our analysis environment also could have been a little bit better because we had some trouble setting up the devices themselves. We were able to, but it was quite a process. Uh, and we could include, include future phases into this methodology. Uh, we could include, include radio frequency analysis, advanced hardware analysis, and binary analysis of ARMS and MIP files. So some devices might have additional capabilities aside from Wi-Fi. They may also have Bluetooth or RF. So there would be more or less other modules you could add into the methodology to ensure that your results are thorough and complete. So as a brief conclusion before we go into the demo, this methodology was created so we could have a universal, holistic, macro-level approach to embedded device vulnerability analysis. Uh, we wanted something that other researchers could follow to create more comprehensive and actionable results. Uh, we tested this on a class of embedded devices. It was a Wi-Fi camera. Uh, we found vulnerabilities that had not yet been published. And we developed an open source tool, Trommel, which is available on GitHub. The link is at the end to aid researchers in embedded device vulnerability analysis. And we expect the methodology to not only expand with future work as well, but with the evolution of embedded devices. This is our contact information. The link to the published paper is there, along with the link to the GitHub for the tool. And Kyle's going to launch into a demo now of Trommel. So I'll, I'll come back to this, right? And, uh... And just to kind of piggyback on Madison saying, it's like we know this is sort of like an incomplete process, right? There's lots of things that we said with the future work, right? And the idea is to kind of outline a sort of a process that people can follow and then throw in what they want to throw in there. You know, a perfect example I can think of yesterday when I look at the, uh, that IoT R RCE talk with the Disney stuff, right? She, was, she mentioned she like ran a bunch of grep sc you know, scripts to find things. I'm like, well, you can use Trommel to help you assist you and not write all those grep scripts and things like that. Um, and we know the process, like we didn't look at any of the binaries on there specifically, that's something we want to do in the future, but like we want to do something out there that uh, kind of hits like the middle of the road, anybody can kind of do, like, you know, doing 
you know, arm analysis is probably more advanced for some people than other people. Let me go ahead and stop this real quick, and then I'll come back to the, the, the uh, links and stuff like that if anybody wants to write that down. Um, so you see here is that I, I basically already have a, a firmware uh, file itself that I have. Uh, I know for specifically reasons this firmware has like a hard-coded Telnet password. We don't need to go into all that, but that's why I sort of chose this. Uh, so I just did this to sort of figure out what directory it was, right? And Trommel's straightforward in the sense that you just give it the path to your, you know, the highest level path that you want to provide for the root directory that contains a file system and it's any kind of output file. Um, like this constant developing tool, I uh, appreciate any feedback that anybody has. I've only had two people give me some decent feedback that's helped along the way. Uh, NJ, the guy who created vFeed, uh, who also runs the Black Hat Arsenal Tools uh, workshop every year at all the different Black Hats. I uh, gave some good feedback, and whoever Cyber Gibbons out there, whoever that person is, they provide some good, good feedback as well. So you just run it. I give you a little insight of what it's doing. Uh, the file name itself is just whatever you give it, plus uh, the name and then a date and uh, timestamp, just in case you run this consistently, you don't overwrite yourself. Um, depending, this takes about 10 seconds sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, depends on how big a file system you have. I'm just gonna pull up in a text editor itself, and then, So it just gives you a dumpster of file. I kind of just say what you call the file, the directory itself, how many files it found in there. Uh, there's probably going to be some false positives in there. Um, some of the newer things I've updated since the first iteration is I try to make it a greppable output itself. I tell you what keyword it is. I tell you what file it looked in. I tell you how many hits it is. I tell you if it's a plain text or not. There's probably going to be some false positives in there versus non-plain text. If it's non-plain text and there's a hit in there, I try to give you the offset of where it is in the file itself. So if it's some kind of binary file and it look, finds the word root in a binary file, you kind of don't spend all your time on a binary file that you might not, you know, that might not be of interest. Um, it could be, you know, there's extensive, there's lots of them in here. Uh, it's grouped by file itself, uh, like where the hit and the file it looks at, right? Um, but you'll know what you're sort of looking for in certain things. Sometimes you don't, then you have this exhaustive list you can go through. Obviously, this doesn't take out 100% of the manual labor. I'd say you still have probably 25 to 30 percent manual labor left to do, but I like to think that this takes a lot of that grepping and figure out the, what the greps is. But like I said, if anybody has any uh, you know, other insight, create issues on the GitHub, I'll put that back up in a second. But like I said, this is allows you to sort of pick and choose, right, uh, you know, what you want to look at. And then later on, if there's any sort of uh, binaries, you'll see like, I pull out the CVE information, and in there you kind of have to go back into the, your device itself, look at like BusyBox, see what version of BusyBox you're using. So you might have to use, you know, QMU and emulate it real quick if you it's ARM or something like that. So you can see what version of BusyBox is installed and then look at the CVEs from there and say, okay, there's six CVEs, but only three of these, you know, match mine, right, at that point in time. Like I said, I'd like to include a lot of that already cut out some of that more manual labor, but that's sort of a process we're working on, right? This is not a static tool. I like to keep developing over time. Oh, yeah, I guess I could do that, too. So, yeah, it's really all you have to provide it is just a path and an output, and that's really it. Um, let me put back up this last slide. Uh, that's good enough. So, that's it. Uh, I know we went a little quick in time, but I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you for staying around on Sunday. and. Uh, any feedback you have, like I said, we greatly appreciate it, and uh, we'll take questions. I wrote it. I wrote it. Yeah, I wrote the whole thing, and then uh, I've gotten feedback, but no one's actually like, I mean, I think people forked it off, but I, I actually wrote it myself, yeah. So Trommel is a tool to use to sift, like gold sifting or whatever like that. And I was like, sift, and like I, was, I wanted to call it a sieve or something like that. That sounds a little weird. So like Trommel sounds a little better, right? So it leaves the good stuff on top. So that's the idea behind it. it leaves the good stuff, ideally the files of interest on top, right? Any other questions? All the way in the back.
So I think the question was, is are vendors using like similar tools during their procurement process of their firmware? Uh, I would hope they're doing something of the sort. I'm not sure. I can't really speak to that. Uh, we do at, you know, at CERT Coordination Center, we coordinate all the vulnerabilities, most of the publicly disclosed vulnerabilities that DHS puts out in those CERT advisories. So like we work with a lot of vendors. Um, I'm not sure what tools they're actually using in their environment, so I can't really comment to that. That's a good question. I would like to think they're trying to do their best effort to test to make sure. But it's sort of, you know, in this case, you still find that they're using like, you know, old versions of BusyBox or other embedded device, you know, like when you know there's a newer version out, right, that ideally wouldn't affect how your, you know, uh, device would work if you include a newer version of BusyBox, but maybe it does. And like, I don't, you know, you never know the process of why they don't just use the most updated file itself or non vulnerable binary, right? So. Yes. You mentioned uh, that you use BinWatch to pull that one firmware apart, and that was kind of a simple case. You said that you've seen a lot more, much more complicated cases of firmware uh, uh, apart. Have you seen any tools, or have you used any tools that help, uh, especially when BinWalk gets really confused? Uh, so the question was, like, have we used any other tools besides BinWalk to you know pull apart firmware? Uh, no, I haven't. I think Binwalk, I've come across Binwalk is pretty good. And if it usually fails, if you go to like a, his issues page, he says, oh, yeah, you probably need to run this bash script that includes like other dependencies for like different sort of uh, compression algorithms. So I found that in the cases where I'm looking at other firmware, not in like, you know, li like Wi Fi cameras that, oh, I'm, I don't have the dependency in Kali for like some compression algorithm that this uses. And it usually then works. A lot of times, it, like sometimes, I found I found more simple cases than they're than in complex, right? Like where it's just like the firmware itself from these other devices I'm looking at are just zipped, and then it's like a bunch of flat files. I'm like, well, that was easy, right? So, any other questions? Well, great, thank you very much. We appreciate it. <laughs>